Our scripture reading this morning is from Psalm 29. I'll be reading from the English Standard Version, a psalm of David. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory do his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders the Lord over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon to skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare. And in his temple all cry glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. So far, the reading from God's word this morning. As we turn our hearts to the word of the Lord, let's look to him in prayer. Father, we are thankful that you have spoken to us by your word and by your spirit. We are thankful that you have called us together to worship. We are thankful that even in this time when there are restrictions on coming together in person, that you have given us the blessing of technology in order to enable us to continue to worship and even to gather together for a time of fellowship after. We pray for your blessing on this day. We pray for your blessing on your word. We pray that your Holy Spirit would pour out on each of your people this morning and work in us all that is pleasing to you through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Last week, we were looking at John chapter 4, particularly verses 23 and 24, which read, The hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers, always to be distinguished from the not true worshipers, will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people. The Father is seeking true worshipers to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. See, as we noted last Sunday, biblically speaking, true seeker-sensitive worship, a term which probably came out of the Willow Creek movement back in the 80s, is not worship that is especially relevant to people who don't know God, so-called seekers, as some would style them, even though Romans 3, quoting Psalm 14 and Psalm 53, tells us none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. Rather, true seeker-sensitive worship is worship that fully recognizes the fact that it is God who, according to Jesus' own word, is the seeker. It is God, the Father, who is seeking people to worship him in spirit and truth. Now, of course, there is so much more here. In spirit and in truth is both the title and the center of the whole series this summer. So I won't be able to get it all into one sermon or into any sermon at one time for that matter. And I hope that as particular sermons in the series might raise questions, you will persevere. And bear with me through the course of the series. Those questions might be answered later. And you're always welcome to come to me with questions outside of the Sunday morning service. In in fact, we are going to depart from the brief little Bible study series that we did on the Psalms, which to be honest, actually led into the text for this morning. And for the summer, our evening Bible study is going to focus on, on paralleling the morning series, giving everyone an opportunity to ask some of those questions in a small group setting. So the Father, God, is seeking such people, people who will worship him in spirit and truth. It it seems really straightforward, but there are several questions that are foundational to understanding what it was that Jesus was saying to this woman at the well in Samaria in John chapter 4. God is seeking people to worship him, but what would that look like? Is it the case that we can just 
come to God, maybe even God as we perceive him to be in any old way that we want to, offering whatever it is that seems right to us with the expectation that somehow, as long as we do our best, which, by the way, no one really does, at least outside of elementary school, that that's all that would matter. Well, that's not the case, and we will hopefully be able to see that over the course of this summer as we dive deeper into the words that Jesus used in this very statement. The Father is seeking such, this kind of people, people who will worship him in spirit and truth. The Father, such people, worship spirit and truth. That's kind of the broad outline, not necessarily in that order and not for this sermon by itself. Trust me, we will never get that far this morning, but for the whole series. The Father, such people, worship spirit and truth. So this is about who is to be worshiped, who it is that does the worshiping, the interior qualifications for said worship, the the heart qualification, if you prefer, and the exterior qualifications, the framework and structure of our worship. That's what we're going to be studying this summer, and if the Lord is willing, we will take time to go quite deeply into these matters. But along the way, it's my hope that we will do more than just study. I have a lot of books on prayer, in my office and some of them eventually work their way around to asking the question why another book on prayer when what we really need to do is just pray and the same could be asked about a book or a series of sermons on worship why do a series of sermons on worship when what we really need is to worship why not just worship Some might even eventually ask the question, why is the sermon even part of our worship service? Wouldn't it be more worthwhile and probably a lot shorter to just skip that part and worship? That, by the way, is one of the questions that will not be answered today, but there is a reason, and it will come up later in the series. The thing is, we need books about prayer because prayer is both an art and a science that we can learn and in which indeed we can grow. When the disciples came to Jesus and they said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, Jesus taught them to pray. He didn't say, hey guys, you don't need to be taught, just go forth and pray. He taught them to pray. And we know this because that incident was recorded for us by some of those who participated and they recorded it in a book so that Jesus' teaching about prayer and about a lot of other things, including worship, could be passed along to be taught to people who were not there to participate on that occasion. Worship, too, is both an art and a science which we can and need to learn and in which we can grow, not by mere study, not by study alone, but by diligent study that leads into and feeds into the diligent practice of worshiping God in spirit and truth. That's why people write books and preach sermons about both prayer and worship, because we really do need to go forth and do both, but we need to go forth and do so in a manner ultimately that is pleasing, not to ourselves, not to our sensibilities, not to our tastes, but to the living God who calls and commands his people to worship in spirit and truth. I remember talking with a colleague who was speaking to another colleague who had asked him, what would you do if you woke up some morning and realized that everything you've been doing in the church for the last 20 years was completely irrelevant? And my friend Mac very wisely responded to that by saying, irrelevant to who? If it's relevant to God, That's the only thing that matters. But before we go on any further talking about who is to worship and who is to do the worshiping and just how such worship is to be offered, there is a question that is foundational to all of those statements. It's at least implied in the last one, how such worship is to be offered. But really, before we can talk about any of that, we need to ask and answer the question, what is worship? 
Now, the dictionary can be of some assistance here. Webster defines worship as a transitive verb, meaning one, to honor or show reverence for as a divine being or supernatural power, or two, to regard with great or extravagant respect, honor, or devotion. And my handy, compact Oxford thesaurus, not to be confused in any way with a Tyrannosaurus, gives the synonyms revere, venerate, pay homage to, honor, adore, praise, glorify, exalt, extol. Some of those words might send us scurrying right back to the dictionary, but you get the idea. Worship as a concept is fairly vague. And it's something that could be offered to just about anyone or anything. Again, Oxford provides us with a couple of examples. One, to offer praise and prayers to a god or goddess, which comes closer to what we're talking about. But then Webster gives the example, a celebrity worshipped by her fans, which is much farther from what we are talking about when we talk about worship, but really, I think, all the more common these days. There's a reason why the show American Idol was called American Idol. And that reason ought to make us very, very sad. But you can see why study, even diligent study, is required. You can see why Jesus did not simply say, go forth and pray, because the next question, and it would have been entirely legitimate, may well have been, yes, but to whom? And for the same reason, it's not enough for the church to simply say, go forth and worship, because on some level, everybody does. Everybody worships something or someone. In the words of Bob Dylan, you got to serve somebody. Might be the devil, might be the Lord, but you got to serve somebody. It's just that most of us, if we are left entirely to ourselves, are going to get it entirely wrong. In ancient times, people worshiped gods and goddesses, as the dictionary told us. Some of those gods and goddesses required human sacrifice. Some of the gods of the Canaanites, encountered by and even worshiped by Old Covenant Israel, required people to throw newborn infants alive into the fire. In Ezekiel 20, verse 31, God said, When you present your gifts and offer up your children in fire, you defile yourselves with all your idols to this day. And shall I be inquired by, of by you, O house of Israel? As I live, declares the Lord God, I will not be inquired of by you. In a somewhat less extreme but still false version of worship, worship I have known people who did not believe in God, they didn't attend church, they didn't make any effort to worship according to the scriptures, but they had a little shrine to Elvis Presley in their home. Now that's not worship, someone might say, but it is when we understand that worship as a concept is simply to regard with great or extravagant respect, honor, or devotion. By that, definition to regard with extravagant respect, honor, or devotion. There are some people who worship the afternoon soaps and others who might legitimately be accused of worshiping the Calgary Flames or the Toronto Blue Jays or any one of the host of celebrity athletes who play for the various teams. In my childhood years, and, and this is showing my age, it was Tony Oliva and Harmon Killebrew, both of whom played for the Minnesota Twins and both of whom have long since gone the way of the Tyrannosaurus. It's been said that people are incurably religious and we have proven this over and over again, not by worshiping the true God, but by always worshiping something. And that something has very often boiled down to worship of ourselves. Again, that's why we don't simply say, go forth and pray, because who would people pray to? It's why we don't simply say, go forth and worship, because who or what would we worship, and how would we do so? At the bottom line, what does that even mean, go forth and worship? Are we to read ancient texts and offer animal sacrifices? Are we to study archaeology and then, like the 
natives of Mesoamerica offer human sacrifices. Both of those things have at one time or another characterized the religious impulse of human beings. Animal sacrifice, and let me be clear, animal sacrifice, not human sacrifice, was even commanded by God himself under the Old Covenant. Answering a somewhat different question and in slightly more modern terms, pastor and author Jeffrey Myers has written, one way to answer the question about the purpose of Christian worship might be to compose a list of the various activities that we typically engage in during the Sunday meeting. We are here to meditate, sit, kneel, stand, hear, sing, pray, confess, praise, read, think, eat, drink, depart, and so on. Of course, with such a list, we have not really answered the burning question, why? Why do we do those things? Why do we do those things and not other things? To what end and for what purpose? What is the point of doing all of this? Well, there is a much more complex answer having to do with God's covenant with us in Christ and the nature of our relationship to God, all of which Jeff Myers very ably addresses in his book, and we will come to it eventually this summer, if the Lord is willing. But I think the answer starts exactly where we started this morning, in Psalm 29, and in many other passages like it. One purpose for worship, and I think that this is the purpose that undergirds all that we will consider this summer, is to respond to that call that was extended to us in verses 1 and 2 of Psalm 29. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Now that little phrase, O heavenly beings, translated mighty ones in the New International Version, could be rendered sons of God, and, and there's a certain ambiguity to it. It could be a call for heavenly beings to worship, Similar to the call in Psalm 103, 20, which said, Bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of the Lord. On the other hand, a parallel to Psalm 29 is found in 1 Chronicles 16. And verse 28 of that psalm says, Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Either way, whether this is a call to worship for all his hosts in all places of his dominion or simply a call to his people in all places of his dominion, it is a call to us. And this call both educates us about worship and enjoins us to the practice of worship. First of all, we hear in the parallelism, and if you're wondering what that is, ask me or anyone who has been to Bible study lately, we find in this parallelism a concise, though incomplete, biblical definition of worship. The psalmist wrote, Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength, ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name, worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. So ascribing to the Lord the glory due his name, and worshiping the Lord in the splendor of his holiness, according to the structure of this psalm, are really one and the same. An older translation has it, give to the Lord glory and strength and so on, which is certainly not wrong. The Hebrew word can definitely mean that. And the word give is actually more familiar to us than the word ascribe. Either one is okay. But I think we have to be careful and we have to keep our focus. As Robert Rayburn has written, the English word worship is a contraction of the original Anglo-Saxon word worthship. Thus, originally, to give worship to anyone simply meant to accord to him the proper recognition of his inherent dignity and value, or to put it another way, to accord to him. We might say to ascribe to him his worth or his worthiness. And it's important for us to keep that in mind if we want to think in terms of give to the Lord glory and strength. Because a few weeks back in our study of the book of Acts, probably 
way more than a few now, we heard Paul say to the Athenians, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. Paul is saying God doesn't need anything from us. Not in proper understanding of the word need. And in Psalm 50, God said, For every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. And just in case you've never heard me talk about this before, all the psalmist is saying is that God owns them all. Not just the cattle on a thousand, but the cattle on a thousand and one too. I know all the birds of the hills and all that moves in the field is mine. If I were hungry, says God, I would not tell you, for the world and its fullness are mine. In that sense, then, we cannot give God anything. People used to occasionally ask the question, what do you get for the man who has everything? Well, no man has everything, but God does. In Romans 11, 35 and 36, the Apostle Paul wrote, Who has given a gift to God that he, the giver of the gift, the human who gave it to him, might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. So when we give glory to the Lord, we're not increasing his glory in any way. We're simply acknowledging the glory which is already his. It's not as if God has a leaky glory tank that constantly needs to be refilled by human beings. In the same way, older translations of the Bible and even the Psalm 103, as I read from the ESV, occasionally use the phrase, bless the Lord, and some have mistakenly taken that to mean that we can do something for God. We can bless him in the same sense that he blesses us, as if we give him something that he is lacking or does not yet have. To put it simply, we can't and we don't. Worshiping God, worshiping God, is not about giving him something that he doesn't already have. It's simply about acknowledging exactly who he is and all that he has done. Therefore, David, the psalmist says, ascribe. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory, do his name. See, not only can we not give God something that he doesn't already have, we can't even give him something that we don't already owe. We ascribe glory and strength to him because that is his due, because that is what we owe, because that is, in point of fact, the reason for which we were created. No wonder Paul asked the question, who has given a gift to God that he might be repaid? Because when we owe something and we pay it, we don't get repaid for that. I had some bills that I had to pay last week and I saw that the money was debited from my account. I don't expect that money to come back to me as a repayment for the bill that I paid. It's simply what I owed and nothing we can give to God, nothing, could be anything more than what we owe to God. As a matter of fact, everything that we give to God, even if we give him everything, is substantially less than we owe to God. So we simply ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. And the parallelism tells us this is what it means to worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. To ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name is to worship him in the splendor of his holiness. And to worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness is to ascribe to him the glory due his name. The two are one and the same. That's how the parallelism works. And this is the simple though incomplete, as I said before, answer to our question, what is worship? To worship the living God is to ascribe to the living God the glory that is his due for all that he is and for all that he has done and for all that he continues to do for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory 
forever. Amen. So when we gather to worship, whether in person or if we gather by some virtual means, this is what our gathering is about. This is our business. It should, of course, go without saying that there is much more to this than mere words. The First Chronicles parallel that I mentioned earlier has it this way, Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength, ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. And then it adds this little line. And, and Chronicles can do that because the Bible can add to another passage from the Bible where we are not supposed to. But Chronicles adds this little line, bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. So again, the parallelism is important, and we see how bringing an offering and coming before him is set as the equivalent of worshiping him in the splendor of his holiness. And there's much more that we will have to say about this in weeks to come. But it's interesting that in our text this morning, in Psalm 29, having called to worship us to worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness, the psalmist goes on to describe really a, a terrifying storm. A storm that sweeps in from the sea, that blazes a trail of lightning and thunder, wind and destruction all across the land. I, I read that a little earlier, beginning in Psalm 29, verse 3. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. That's the sea. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders the Lord over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. Understand that this is not just some primitive who hears in the thunder that cracks down from the sky the, the voice of the gods. This is David, the psalmist, a man after God's own heart who understands that phenomenon which take place in our world, created things tell of the glory of God. So the voice of the Lord speaks in the storm. The voice of the Lord speaks in the thunder. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon to skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. Imagine the storm blowing up dust and causing the land to just blow away. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. And if we could take time to chart all of that on a map, we could chart the exact progress of the storm that was in David's mind from the Western Sea, the Mediterranean Sea, all the way down through Kadesh and on into the Arabian Peninsula. More importantly, though, particularly for us, particularly in the storms that are swirling all around us today, in pandemics and in protests and in persecution. More important is the conclusion of the matter. Verse 9, the voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth. That's generally understood to be because the deer are so afraid. And it strips the forest bare. And in his temple, all cry glory. So even and I think especially in the storm. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord the glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory. Do his name and worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. For of him and through him and to him are all things now and forever. Amen.